my name is Wade. I recently developed a renewable energy model for the Australian states of South Australia and Victoria. It's a pretty simple model. I, I developed it for use by high school students, but I thought I'd share it here. Okay, first of all, you, to get the model, it's not on a website, it's on a Google Drive account. So to find it, you'll need to go to the links below. One of the links should be to that model, which is an Excel spreadsheet. So just download it using this button up here. Another link will be to the accompanying Word document, which explains how the model works. So again, just use the link and then download it. Okay, once you've downloaded the model, it should come up on a page like this. The spreadsheet has numerous pages here. First one, 2014-15A is the model we're going to be using today. 2014-15B is identical. Okay, 2015-16 is for a second year's worth of data, which I'm currently gathering. And there's a couple other pages, which I won't go into here. Okay, so the first one, the model. What the model does is it models a renewable energy supply to the Australian states of South Australia and Victoria to supply them with electricity. During It runs from 1st of April 2014 at 3am, first when the data was first captured, at three hourly intervals, 3am, 6am, 9am, etc. right through to midnight on the 31st of March of 2015. Okay, so it captures real data for those two states. Now, for those who aren't familiar with Australia, I'll see if I can find a map where we can see where South Australia and Victoria are. Okay, this is the country of Australia. It's in the Southern Hemisphere, just south of Asia, for those who aren't familiar with it. Okay, the two states we're interested in are Victoria, which is this state here. And beside it is South Australia, this state, here, much larger state here. The model, the electricity de uh, delivered by the grid for these two states covers this area. All of Victoria receives electricity from the grid and this area of South Australia. This larger area of South Australia doesn't have much population so the grid doesn't extend out there or the main electricity grid. They tend to have smaller grids. Okay, so we're looking to deliver electricity to this area using a 100% renewable and renewable supply. This area is about 600,000 square kilometres, which is about the area of, say, France, if you're in Europe. And it has a population of about 7 million people. About 4 million people are living in the capital city of Victoria down here, Melbourne, and another million in Adelaide, the capital city of South Australia, and the other 2 million people are spread throughout the region. Okay, so how does the model deliver the energy? What it does is it takes real data for wind and solar, or solar PV, for the model time from 1st of April through to the 31st of March. Where I got the wind data from is this website. This is a Wind Energy in Australia website. It captures in real time, it's currently, I took this at 11.20 a.m. this morning, I loaded this page. It captures the wind energy or wind power being generated by the wind turbines across Australia. We can see that most of them, or across this eastern part of Australia, we can see that most of them are concentrated in South Australia and Victoria, some up in southern New South Wales and a couple in northern Tasmania. I use the average capacity factor for this entire area. It's conveniently displayed on a graph here. So at 3 p.m. just a moment. So at 3 p.m. yesterday afternoon, the capacity factor was 38%. The capacity factor means the percentage of the maximum capacity. Currently in this region, there is about 3.6 gigawatts of wind capacity. So if it was at or 40%, so it would be 40% of that 3.6 gigawatts was being delivered to the grid at that time. Up here, it's 50%, which would be 1.8 gigawatts, because that's 50% of 3.6 gigawatts. Okay, so that's, this is where I captured the wind data from. It runs from the 1st of April right, right until the current day. I captured the data just by looking at the graph. So every three hours, midnight, 3 a.m., 6 a.m., and I just read off the data, just read off the 
uh, value here. Okay, so that was the data for the wind capacity factor. Okay, I also captured this PV or solar photovoltaic capacity factors for this region. I use this other website to do it to do that. This is the Australian Photovoltaic Institute. I believe it's administered uh, administered by the University of New South Wales Photovoltaics Group. You can look them up on a web search. What it does is it shows the PV output as a capacity factor percentage of the maximum at different times of the day for every day for the past few years they've been running this. So if we're looking at the states of South Australia and Victoria, South Australia is here, Victoria is here at say 11 a.m. this morning. You can see that South Australia was running at 30% of its maximum capacity and Victoria was running, running at 33% of its maximum capacity. The PV data for these two states is rooftop PV. That is, it's being installed by individuals, not by big companies. And it doesn't appear as information on the grid at the moment. So it's behind the meter energy. But we can use this data to model what would have been created by the grid and other rooftop PV for these two areas, for Victoria down here in South Australia. I'm using an average of these two values because that's the sort of capacity factors you'd be likely to see if there was much larger amounts of PV as well as not just rooftop but as well as um, utility scale or commercial scale PV. Okay, back to the model and we'll see how it works. What you do is there are five inputs. You only really need to change four of them though. One input controls the amount of wind capacity in the model. Currently, as I said, there's about 3.6 gigawatts. So if I was mo modeling current output, I'd have something like this. You change this number and it shows the wind capacity, 3.45 gigawatts, let's say. If you wanted to put more wind capacity, so you're going to build more wind turbines in the region, you just change this number up here and it changes the value in here for wind capacity. Same thing for PV or the solar. Just change this value. Currently there's about 1.7 gigawatts. So if I wanted current output, I'd put it in like this. But you can put in any amount. Just going to start with one up here, which means 7.2 gigawatts of PV capacity. So that's the maximum amount of power that could be generated by PV in that area if they're all working at 100% at the same time. Okay, this third value here is storage capacity. Currently there is zero storage in the region. Actually there's, there's a small amount of pumped hydro, but I can't remember what, what value it has. So you can put in an amount of storage, it could be batteries, it could be pumped hydro, it could be thermal storage. You'll have to look those, if you're not aware of what those things mean, just look them up. Just do an internet search. Okay, and this is in gigawatt hours, so 100 gigawatt hours of storage. In the region they use about 160 gigawatt hours of energy a day. So that amount of storage would be about 63% of the average daily energy used in that region. So during the year from the 1st of April through the 31st of March, they used 58,000 gigawatt hours of energy. Where I got that from is demand. These are the official demand values for this region during the year. And I don't have that open. I'll have to open up a new web page to show you where it's from. I got this data from the Australian Energy Market Operator. They run the electricity grid in all of that region, eastern and southern Australia. So they're the people who run the grid. And conveniently at the end of each day, at midnight of each day, they put up the demand values. Go to the main website. Go through and for South Australia Victoria, historically, you can go to this page. And it gives the demand values for each month at half hourly intervals, the power demand. So I went through and collected all of those and they're listed here. At 3 a.m. the power demand was this, 5.6 gigawatts. 6 a.m. it was 6.8 gigawatts, etc. This is the sum of the demand for South Australia and Victoria. Okay, so how the model works is you put in your value for wind capacity, just say it's 8.62 gigawatts, you put in a value for PV capacity, 17.2, put in a value for value for storage capacity, 100 gigawatt hours. The model uses this by calculating the amount of wind power that would, produ would be produced by this capacity factor and this capacity over here. So if 
we had 8.6 gigawatts of capacity working at 29% of its maximum it would be producing 2.5 gigawatts of power at 3 a.m. on the 1st of April last year. Similarly for PV 3 a.m. there was zero PV because it's night time at 9 a.m. it was working at 26% of its maximum it would be producing 5.76 gigawatts of power. What I do then is add these two values so C7 plus E7 is just this value plus this value to get the total power from wind and PV I'm going to compare that with the demand. So currently you can see it's a bit more than demand. This column gives the difference between the two, supply minus demand. When I have a positive supply, that can be used to recharge the storage. That is basically recharging batteries or pumping the water back into the pumped hydro, etc. So we can see the storage up here. It's increasing here because I'm using the excess supply to recharge storage. Now, storage the uh, charging and discharging of storage isn't 100% efficient. It loses some energy during that process. Here I'm modeling it to lose 20% of the total energy. Okay, so this value is 20% lower than this one, than the excess. That's a 20% or 80% efficiency is pretty realistic. Pumped hydro has 75% efficiency. Thermal storage is about 75% efficiency. Batteries can go up to 95% efficiency. So taking a weighted average of those things will give a store, uh, charge, discharge, charge discharge efficiency of, for the storage of about 80% uh, or 0.8 as you see in this formula up here. When the demand exceeds supply, I'll get a negative number here. This means some of the supply has to be, uh, some of the demand has to be supplied by something other than the PV and wind because they're not providing enough energy at this time, enough electricity. So that deficit in supply can be supplied by either the storage. So here we can see that the value in storage is going down. And this amount of power is being supplied to the grid from storage. At other times, when the storage gets too low, an amount of auxiliary generation, auxil auxiliary generation kicks in. Now the auxiliary generation is from readily dispatchable sources such as hydroelectricity or biogas or biomass. If you weren't using renewable supplies, it'd be from something like natural gas. Okay, so from biogas, biomass, hydro generators are now supplying two, about two gigawatts of power to make up demand. This way, it always ensures supply meets demand. How do I work this out? I use this rather complicated algorithm here to work out how much auxiliary generation I need to add to make sure supply meets demand. Now that entire algorithm is controlled by these two numbers here. You won't need to change this number, that's more for fine tuning. This number here decide, uh, changes the output of that auxiliary generation. I'll show you how to do this. I'm going to split the screen here so we can see a graph. Okay, this is the same spreadsheet. I'm going to arrange these horizontally. And this one, I'm going to show you how it changed demand. This one will show a graph where you can see those changes. Okay, so below here we have a graph showing the output of storage. The pale pink line is how much power storage is adding to the grid at this time. The dark red line is the demand value. The blue line is the level of energy in storage divided by three. The reason it's divided by three is because of the three hour time interval. The dark green line is the amount of power being added by auxiliary generation. Now we can see that if I change this number here, the dark green line will change in value. And so will the amount of power from storage because their feedbacks they affect each other. Okay, so the idea when using the model is to minimize the maximum amount of auxiliary generation. I know that sounds confusing because you have to minimize the maximum, but you want the maximum value, the peak value up here, to be as small as possible. That means you won't have to build as much auxiliary, auxiliary generation as otherwise. For this particular build, for these numbers up here, the 1, 1, 100, the minimum value is about 5. It might be a bit smaller. Okay, down to 5.78, I think that's about what the minimum is. You can check, let's go a bit smaller here. Okay, it's starting to increase again. It's gone up to 5.82. So the minimum would be given about 5.78 gigawatts. So that's the minimum for the whole year. 
or that's the minimum amount you'd need to build so that's the maximum value that we'll see at any time in the year and the graph extends throughout the if I can get it to work throughout the whole year you can see the graph extending below it there is a second graph hopefully which is showing the wind power the PV power and the auxiliary generation power at any particular time so the area under the graph would be the energy being produced on each day the days line up so this was the 21st of May 2014 so in my model the demand is this that's the real demand so that's what the demand was for the day if I had those settings for wind and PV and storage shown above I'd have this much wind power on the day or this much wind energy PV power and energy and auxiliary generation and an energy needed to make supply meet demand okay so that's a bit of background on how the model works these columns up, up here just uh, monitors the storage level to make sure it doesn't exceed the maximum okay so the model will work as long as there's a positive number up here it's designed to work as long as there's a positive number up here and you've got positive numbers here so this is the end of part one in part two I'll explain how to use these values to optimize the output in the model so thanks for listening part two you should be able to find in one of the links below